Hi, everybody. My name is Craig Cardassi, and I want to welcome you to Out on Films in Conversations. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Rich Eldridge, who is going to moderate uh, this conversation with the directors from Equal, which you have just seen. So, Rich, welcome to Out on Films Conversations, and I'll leave this to you. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, and I want to uh, introduce Kimberly Reed, uh, the episode of Transgender Pioneers, which was episode 102 of Equal, and Stephen Kayak, who uh, directed uh, the episode that we've seen, Black is Beautiful, Gay is Good, uh, and also serves as the executive producer uh, for the four-part docuseries uh, HBO Max original that will debut October 22nd. I want to get that in there a couple of times. Uh, Kimberly, I want to start with you. I think most of us will probably know your work as a producer from Prodigal Sons in 2008 and uh, 2017's wonderful The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what attracted you to this project and this episode in particular. Uh, the thing I, I, that I found really attractive when Stephen first uh, approached me about this is the, the opportunity to not only tell the stories of um, some well-known trans folk who we may have heard of, like Christine Jorgensen, um, but it was also really interesting to tell a lot of untold stories, these kind of, you know, the stories behind the stories that we don't really know, because it's sort of easy for a lot of LGBT LGBTQ plus folks to just think that the whole gay world started with Stonewall in 1969 and nothing ever happened before that. Um, I find it really personally inspiring to think about these smaller stories about activists who are just living their own lives and, you know, doing so really courageously in a, in a world that wasn't very accepting of them as all, at all. Um, and to think about these people lead, leading their daily lives as activists and activists who were paving the way um, for future generations of LGBTQ plus uh, folks um, to sort of stand on their shoulders and build on the foundation that these really brave people uh, were building. And um, it just, it, it, it was a really unique opportunity. And then when Steven started talking about um, actually making the visual presentation of it something other than sort of a run-of-the-mill uh, documentary. Um, when just in, in one of our first conversations, we, um, Stephen was talking about having a, a, just a queer sensibility for this film about queer issues. And sometimes we're not, we're not very creative uh, and we don't really um, have this meld of form and content. So uh, to have this really interesting content with all these stories that we hadn't heard about before and a really fresh, visual, daring, queer, un, you know, unabashedly queer approach to making this. Uh, it, was, it was just a super exciting project to be a part of. And Stephen, as, as Kimberly points out, this is not your typical talking head uh, series of, of, you know, this is not a talking head documentary. This is a docu-series where you're actually, um, actors are bringing these, these people to life. Uh, can you talk us through uh, that artistic decision to kind of freshen up this genre? Yeah, sure. At first, I just want to correct you. I was not the executive producer of the show. I, I am a producer on the show, kind of showrunner, uh, you know, across the series. Our, our EPs are much bigger names than me. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the approach, uh, it was partly out of necessity, you know, uh, it was brought to me by Scout Productions who had these ambitions to do really like a big scale kind of thriller-esque recreations. Uh, their list of potential scenes was voluminous, you know, and I was like, we, at the time, this was supposed to be on the air in June. So given the time of the budget, I just thought there's absolutely no way we can do this unless we rescale our ambitions and I've always been a huge fan of uh, Derek Jarman's films you know and later in his life you know his kind of aesthetic after Caravaggio sort of shrunk to these fantastic tableaus actors kind of centered on a little theatrical set sometimes with rear projections you know historical but ever so slightly campy um, and arch and I thought what a great you know way to weigh in to like use 
uh, stylistic reference that has like a queer lineage to it and then apply it to these historical stories. So, you know, we kind of thought in those theatrical terms of, you know, monologues, single characters, limited sets, projections, just trying to create a very unique stylistic approach uh, that would let us tell these stories and elevate the stories too, because, you know, a lot of the, we're, we're, we're delving so far into the past that in, you, you would just left, be left with like expert talking heads. You wouldn't be able to access the subjects. So let's throw the rules out a little bit and kind of mix it up. That was the idea. And Kimberly, as you point out, uh, one of the things I love best about uh, documentaries is when I get to uh, take a deep dive into, into lives that I previously did not know about. Uh, and that's my main takeaway from uh, obviously your, your documentary on, on Marsha. You know, it was this thorough examination of a life that has been uh, tragically underreported. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about delving into the lives of Lucy Hicks, Anderson, and Jack Starr, especially as, as you point out, uh, Christine Jorgensen, um, I, I think uh, the way she lived her life uh, was very out and open and wanted to have an ongoing dialogue with the public about who she was. How, how difficult was it researching and getting uh, you know, photographs and, and, and news clippings of these other individuals? Uh, well, lucky, luckily, we had a, a really good team of researchers. Suze Curtis started off um, some a really uh, kind of deep trove of research that we could draw on. And then uh, our main research contact was Jenny Olson, uh, who has really made a life of finding a lot of uh, queer material, um, in some cases that, that people just haven't seen before at all. Um, and so uh, giving us just kind of allowing us to scrape the surface a little bit about these these two main characters that you're talking about that a lot of people um, just haven't had any chance to come across. Um, and uh, in some cases, like uh, with Jack Starr, all we really had were a handful of headlines and a couple of photos, uh, which which Jenny had had dug out. And by piecing these together, um, you could come up with a sense of of who Jack was, probably how he would have self-identified, even though that can be a problematic, um, anachronistic challenge to project, you know, terminology that didn't exist at the time back on these people. Um, but I felt like with the research that, that was done, that we were really able to understand, you know, who these people were, uh, get a sense for, in Jack's case, how, how, uh, how clever he was, um, what a kind of roguish uh, he was. And I kind of fell in love with Jack. Um, in the same way, Lucy Hicks Anderson uh, was somebody that really only existed in a couple headlines and a couple photos that we managed to dig up. Um, and again, you know, Jenny's research there was, was really invaluable. Um, but, you know, it was also a big challenge to kind of get on the other side <laughs> of what these headlines were saying. Because if you just go by the headlines and you just look at the way that these trans people were being treated in the day, um, it's just rife with misgendering. The, the way the press treated these folks um, was really based on um, this purely sensationalistic approach where everybody's reaction is like, oh my God, that's really a, you know, a dude, not a lady, or whatever. This, this terribly insensitive and um, this kind of misgendering approach to the whole thing. So it was also fun to unpack who these people really were. And that's why Stephen's approach of um, having these reenactments uh, with the great actors that we managed to get, um, Alexander Gray playing Lucy Hicks Anderson and Theo Germain playing Jack Starr, um, I, I think, you know, hopefully we gave you a sense of who these people were at the time. And what I love about what Kim did with that episode, too, I want to mention, is it's probably one of the more scripted of all the episodes. A lot of the other episodes do rely on existing written documents and testimony and all that. But Kim was really able to, you know, with the research, really embody and kind of get inside these characters and give them voices and just kind of we were able to, like, imagine 
a lot of it and just bring it to life in a way that you normally wouldn't if you were had these limited materials at your disposal. So it's really, uh, it's, it's one of our favorite things is just, you know, not only finding these characters, but the ability to give them voices and create this, this, the reality of their worlds uh, in a way that you've really never seen before. It's a fabulous episode. Well done, Kim. That holds true for, uh, oh, thanks. I think that holds true <laughs> for Compton's Cafeteria too, which is this yeah. historical yeah. event that a lot of folks uh, don't really know about, but we were able to piece together some, you know, little hints of this and hints of that. Uh, Susan Stryker, uh, particularly for that section of episode two, was also just an invaluable consultant who has done um, so much research about that. There are only, you know, a couple details, a couple sh um, shards of, you know, things that we know actually happened. And so it was our challenge to, to just stitch them together. And Kimberly, I'm glad you, you referenced uh, Compton's Cafeteria. So you, you choose to bookend the, your episode with, with that. Uh, 1966, there's a marker there now. Uh, it was placed there, I think, in 2006, uh, the Tenderloin District of Sa San Francisco. This was like so many of our all night haunts that we go to after we've been out all night. Uh, this was, uh, this was a, a, a destination for uh, LGBTQ plus people after hours. Uh, a gathering place, uh, a safe space, if you will, and everything was turned upside down, uh, you know, in the course of, of one night. Uh, the fact that most people do not know about this, and most people, as you point out, they think the entry point for uh, gay rights is Stonewall. Uh, you know, I can't help but think how many people you're going to help educate by bookending uh, very wisely this episode with this this very significant piece of gay rights history that most of us don't know about. Mm. Yeah, Compton's was, uh, the, I mean, as Susan Stryker put it, the first violent uprising of queer and trans folk uh, against the police. So um, without that around, I don't know if that would have been in the air, you know, for the Black Cat riots, which we cover in um, later in the episodes, and um, for of course Stonewall, that, which came ended up coming three weeks, three years later. And Stephen, in the episode uh, "Black is Beautiful, Gay is Good," uh, I think a lot of people, of course, will know who uh, Lorraine Hansberry is, uh, a raisin in the sun, uh, the first African American woman to have a play on Broadway. She was this this wonderful intellectual who uh, lent her voice to the civil rights movement but I don't think a lot of us will know about her personal life. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the, what you were able to find in, in the research that ended up making it into that episode from, from her personal life? Sure, yeah. I mean, when, again, when the, episode, when the show was developed and brought to me, like we kind of had to sort of redevelop a lot of the creative. I mean, that episode initially was really kind of Byard Rustin and then Black Cat. You know, and I thought it's a kind of lopsided thematically and like w we need to figure out a way to create more of a, a structural and thematic bridge that's more inclusive. Um, and because the civil rights movement had such a great impact on the gay rights movement through the 60s, it seemed important to kind of turn the heat up on that and really look at these important figures. And then again, Jenny Olson, who I can't give enough credit to for being really crucial in feeding us information and research. Uh, Jack Starr was kind of one of her pet projects. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry was her suggestion. She's just like, you know, there are a lot of dudes in this series. How about, you know, X, Y, Z? And she would, she pushed a lot of narratives uh, our way that hadn't been on the deck initially. So yeah, Lorraine Hansberry, you know, um, it, the, the crux of that was the piece by Elsie El Harris. Uh, it was an article she had written and published in Al Magazine in 1999 called The Double Life of Lorraine Hansberry. And it was the first time that Lorraine Hansberry's, uh, you know, homosexuality was really dealt with and talked about. Uh, she had interviewed a bunch of women who were her lovers. Um, and then as time went on, some of the gay uh, papers in her estate were loosened up a little bit so people could go and research that stuff. They weren't released to the public, but you can go to the library and look at some of these restricted materials and some of the writings 
Um, we do know that Lorraine wrote letters to the latter, right? The lesbian magazine published by the Daughters of Belitis under just initials. She has, uh, we had a whole section that ended up getting cut out based around uh, a short story she wrote called The Anticipation of Eve, which is about a woman struggling to figure out how to tell her friends and families that she, family that she is living with a woman and has a girlfriend, you know? Um, and so, yeah, the idea was really just to take this great article and turn it into a little play, you know, just use Lorraine's, you know, medium and turn it into a little theatrical experience that would allow us to explore the, the intimate side of her life and her sexuality while also continuing to broadcast to the world her brilliant radicalism and political activism. Uh, she's just a fascinating character who gets more and more fascinating the more you learn about her, you know. Uh, and while not directly contributing to the movement in her lifetime, her thinking about it and her just her politics alone are so inspiring, um, you know. And uh, she was a pioneer, you know, absolutely just such an inspiration. So a real thrill to bring her story to light a little more. I want to bring in some audience questions for both of sure. you. Uh, as you have uh, mentioned as uh, the showrunner uh, and the director of, of three of the episodes, uh, there were some very big names attached to this ensemble, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Uh, can you talk about how hard it was getting that ensemble put together? Uh, it wasn't hard at all. We have, I mean, this came to me with Greg Berlanti and Jim Parsons on his EP, Scout Productions, HBO Max. I mean, it was like ready to go. It just, uh, you know, me and my team had to pull a crew together. And obviously I reached out to Kim to direct an episode. We're old, old friends. So it was really just uh, building a creative team to execute it. And, you know, Greg Berlanti brought in his wonderful uh, casting associates, uh, and they just went to town, you know? I mean, people really responded to it. And uh, it was a small commitment, you know? They're in and out in a day. They just have to deliver a monologue or do one scene and, and, and then they're off. So uh, it was, we made it easy for people to engage with the project. And we just found that there was a, a huge amount of enthusiasm for it. Um, even after we had to shut down and come back to life after COVID to get episode four in the can, actors were just, you know, lining up to do it. Really a lot of support on that side. Yeah, and I just really have to say that the producers, Diane Becker and Melanie Miller, have they assembled an, an incredible team and it was just really a producing tour de force to yeah. um, be shut down in the middle and to come back. And, uh, you know, once we got shut down during production after the first three episodes, all of the post-production took place remotely, um, which came with a lot of challenges. So mm -hmm. it was an amazing job pulling it all together. Uh, Kimberly, I'll pose this question for you uh, from the audience, uh, I, just because I, I think that your episode in particular uh, just speaks to this moment in our history. Uh, audience question is, why is this a good time for this series? Wow, um, you know, like, like I was, uh, um, talking about a little bit earlier by learning these stories of just everyday trans folk who are just trying to live their life and the, the gender presentation that felt natural to them um that was kind of an activist move um i don't need to tell anybody that trans folk are still under attack um it looks like just with all the political turmoil that's going on right now that we're about to hit another big wave uh, with a different court. You know, our lives are, as trans people, are legislated in a way that a lot of other people's aren't. Um, and if with the swipe of a pen, you know, you're finding out that you can't use this bathroom or can't play on that team or can't walk into this place without, you know, just because of who you are, um, I, I think it's really good for us to be able to draw on these stories of people like Lucy Hicks Anderson, of people like Jack Starr, of uprisings of, of people that take place at Compton's um, to inform us and to inspire us so that we don't feel like we're reinventing the wheel. We feel like we have 
as the episode says, shoulders to stand on to see, you know, how we can be strong and, and brave and consistent and uh, just keep pushing back to, to be who we are. Steven, if you look at footage of the 1963 March on Washington, uh, Bayard Rustin is literally at people's shoulders mm -hmm. throughout the day. Uh, and I, I had the great privilege of uh, guest editing the upcoming issue of Atlanta Magazine dedicated to Atlanta Pride's 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. which, which will be out on newsstands this week. And for the issue, I interviewed uh, former Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young, and uh, who of course was uh, an aide to MLK. And he told me for this issue, he said, uh, Bayard Rustin was the first out gay person I knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had people uh, like Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, who were trying to talk Dr. King into getting rid of him uh, prior to the March on Washington. And he said, Dr. King just looked at these critics and said, uh, he's the best organizer we know. Uh, so of course he's going to be in charge of this thing. But it, it, it is, you know, and then you look at John Lewis, who the first major speech of his life happens at the March on Washington. And yet Bayard Rustin uh, gave a few remarks, but mm -hmm. didn't give that, that, that career making speech uh, because of his life as a gay man, as an out gay man. Uh, do you feel like the ripples from Rustin's life uh, will uh, continue to reverberate and, and that the fact that his life is included in this episode matters? Absolutely. I mean, you know, he is a foundational figure of the movement. I mean, he's the one that really schooled King in the ways of passive resistance. You know, he went to India, he studied the methods of Gandhi. Uh, he was the mentor and the elder in that relationship. And it was his homosexuality that continued to keep him sort of in the shadows a bit, you know, but, uh, and, and part of his struggle, I mean, he was always kind of out and open about who he was, but it was, uh, he, at the time, the, the feeling was like his sexuality wasn't central to his work. So let me sort of sublimate my sexuality a bit for the greater good, which is at the time, you know, what he had to do. I will always uh, refer everybody who was inspired by this, this show and Byard's story to uh, get into the feature film, Brother Outsider, The, the Life of Byard Rustin. Uh, our great friends, um, you know, Bennett, uh, Bennett, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. Um, you know, uh, that is an excellent, um, there's actually, uh, I, I will say, uh, especially Bennett Singer, I'm sorry. Um, uh, between Rustin and Lorraine Hansberry, you know, and across the whole series, there are feature length explorations of a lot of these stories that, you know, talk about standing on the shoulders of other people. You know, we, we also stand on the shoulders of a lot of the historians, researchers, and filmmakers who went before us. You know, to a lot, of, a lot of ways, I feel like we're trying to shine a light on this, these stories at a very specific angle. And I really hope people dig deeper. You know, uh, Lorraine Hansberry's film, the, the film is uh, Sighted Eyes, you know, um, Sighted Eyes, uh, oh my God, my brain today, I'm sorry. Weekend away, I've lost my mind. Um, there's great work to be done, there's great work to explore uh, around all these characters. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, without Rustin's, um, Rustin's work in the movement, you know, the, he, was, he was at the foundation of all of it. So, you know, a lot more to learn about him and his work. Absolutely. Sighted uh, Eyes, Feeling Hearts, that's the film. There anyway. we go. Thank yes. You. So you're encouraging people to, to explore things in search engines. I appreciate that. Uh, so Kimberly, another audience question for you. Uh, was there anything that surprised you uh, in doing the research and presenting these, these, these lives uh, on film? Uh, yeah, interesting. You know, um, I don't know if it was a huge surprise, but it was also really cool to see the actors connect with these characters that they're playing. Um, and each of them, um, Theo Germain, who played Jack Starr, uh, they told me 
that, um, you know, this is obviously the first time that they were hearing about Jack Star. Um, but it was just really great to see them connect with Jack Star uh, in a way, it didn't, it, as Stephen said, uh, almost all of these people were just with us one day on set. So they had to get in and connect and, and, and move on. Um, the same thing happened with Alexandra Gray uh, in a great day of shooting where um, she was playing Lucy Hicks Anderson. Jamie Clayton, um, you know, di di didn't have a lot to do because we were kind of keep coming back to the spine of her section, which is walking down um, and walking down a staircase off of a off of a plane onto the tarmac in this probably the most famous shot that people know of Christine Christine Jorgensen um, and then also with Isis King who was our narrator for the Compton's section like each of them um, I, I think each of them cried at one point or another during the day because they were just realizing that there was this deep well of history and these these people who they were playing that they didn't know all that much about, they were learning a lot about these historical events and these historical people. And um, that, it, was, it was surprising and it was also just really poignant watching that connection happen. It was very cool. And I hope that that's what viewers take away from this too. I would be remiss in my responsibilities uh, as moderator without mentioning the wonderful work of Billy Porter as the narrator mm -hmm. of this series. Uh, so many documentaries will lull you to sleep with with lovely narration. Uh, you will not fall asleep oh, uh, no. listening to Billy Porter narrate this. Uh, who ended up directing that? Oh, that was me. I mean, we we actually took turn. I mean, Kim, you know, was there directing Billy for uh, episode one hundred two, uh, and yeah, I mean, we wanted him to just be as as uh, you know militant, forceful, high energy as possible. You know, I mean, we wrote the narration in such a way as to focus in on the militancy behind the message, you know, uh, a, a little preachy, a little in your face, um, but fun and just, you know, we wanted him to give it his own spin and do it in his own voice as much as possible. And uh, yeah, I mean, having, having to listen to our own voices or our friends do all the temp narration once he was in there everything just kind of went up several notches he's so engaging he really like he, he walks you through these episodes in a way that you feel like you're in really good hands you know and he's energizing and exciting and funny and um it's a real it was a real thrill to have him involved and again it, re it really felt like you know steven set us up with this design of the overall um docuseries that we were able to bring a queer sensibility to this in a way that like, we felt like we could break rules. And that was really, really liberating to work on. I wanna be uh, conscientious of our, our time limitations here. Uh, so I, I wanna close this out by posing to both of you the, the question, and again, uh, Equal will debut uh, on HBO Max, October 22nd. There are four episodes. It's an original HBO Max docuseries that we were lucky enough to preview two episodes here at Out on Film. Uh, and Kimberly, I'll start with you. What do you want audiences to take away uh, after they've screened all four episodes? What, what are the, uh, because this just feels like such an important time in America. What, what, what do you want audiences to take away from this viewing experience? Well, of course, I want them to learn the stories of, of Jack and Lucy and Christine and, and Compton's Cafeteria and be inspired by those stories and their own kind of personal activism, what it kind of requires to be queer these days. You really have to have to step up. Um, but more than anything else, I think I just want to I, I just want to wet people's appetites. I mean, that was one of the one of the aims of the whole series that, you know, we can only cover so much in these these episodes, which are under an hour and we're moving pretty quickly. Um, I hope it makes people really curious to to go and, and discover more to dig into who some of these other folks are. Yeah, and to just to add to that. Yeah, it's it's a primer, you know, uh, culturally, historically, and, and politically, you know, um, we wanted to hang on to that sense of urgency, uh, because the, the, the more we got into it, the more it started, you know, we saw the parallels with our own 
there's constant parallels between what's going on today and what was happening with these people. If you look at each episode, each episode is kind of built around its own sort of riot raid or civil disobedience moment that pushed things forward. So you see how those flashpoints and those people that are organizers um, and who do, you know, act as wedges to crack history open can really make a change. And even though it feels like, you know, things kind of fold back on themselves and we're kind of back to where we started, you can really see that it's it's the power of these individuals working individually and then collectively, um, sometimes through these moments of uh, violence and rebellion that are, are needed to, uh, you know, keep keep the fire going and keep us moving forward. So it's a good time to be reminded that that's always been there, especially in queer history, um, but across all social movements. Um, we hope it adds to that forward momentum, you know. And I just want to remind the audience that if your appetite has indeed been wet uh, by watching these two preview episodes, Equal, an HBO Max original docuseries, debuts October 22nd. Kimberly Reed, Stephen Kayak, thank you so very much for this wonderful conversation. And thank you. I, thank you. Um, and on behalf of our audience, uh, thank you very much for the questions. On behalf of Out on Film, I'm Rich Eldridge.